Coming to you from New York, New York, this is the official Gilded Age podcast. Hello, welcome back to the official Gilded Age podcast, the companion to the new HBO original series, The Gilded Age. I'm Alicia Malone from Turner Classic Movies, and I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Tom Myers. (laughs) Oh, stop, Alicia, really blushing every single time. Hi, I'm Tom (laughs) Myers from the Bowery Boys New York City History podcast. And last week on the official Gilded Age podcast, Alicia and I discussed the locations, the real New York City locations that we visited so far in the show and how the series has recreated the world of New York City in the 1880s. Yeah, that was fascinating. And you know, this week we're gonna take a look at the idea of the American dream in the Gilded Age, the types of industries that were booming at this time, like the railroad industry, which of course is very important in the show. Very important. And in the second half of the show today, we'll be chatting with Cynthia Nixon, who stars as Ada Brooke in the series, and with this episode's director, Sally Richardson Whitfield. Stay tuned. So let's get into episode three of The Gilded Age. It's written by Julian Fellows and directed by Sally Richardson Whitfield. And let's start by chatting about our friend, George Russell. His plans for a new train station in New York City were thwarted by the city alderman who passed the law and then took it back. So George comes up with the idea of buying up all of his stock to punish the alderman, like Patrick Morris, who is in deep with stock. So deep, I cannot see the sky, as he says. He is desperate and on the verge of losing everything, so he sends his wife to plead for mercy with Mrs. Russell. I want you to ask him to show a little pity, to show mercy. Forgive me, but this is in payment for what? I don't understand. You come into my house, you make this strange request, and I'm trying to establish why. Do you feel I owe a debt of gratitude? Have you granted me a favor that merits a return? No. No. (laughs) Mrs. Morris, I hesitate to teach the basics, but life is like a bank account. You cannot write a check without first making a deposit. Mrs. Morris is leaving. Yes, ma'am. Cold, Bertha, so cold. (laughs) Cold and so perfect. I think this is actually when I really started to like Bertha. I mean, that, that's a total mic drop. Absolutely. But wait, can we just step back for a second and talk about what exactly is going on here with these aldermen? Why are Patrick Morris and the others going to lose everything? Uh, Because they're in a bit of a jam. Earlier in the show, remember, we learned that the aldermen were going to buy shares of his company and then pass the law for the new station and then make a quick profit through this kind of insider trading. But here, at the beginning of episode three, we realize actually that the aldermen have double-crossed George Russell. Yeah, he reads the article in the paper saying that the station won't be built because they have changed their minds. Exactly. And he realizes that instead of investing in his company, you know, hoping that the stock price would go up, they're actually trying to sell the shares short and they'll make money if the value of the stock goes down. And how does that work? Well, yeah, it sounds counterintuitive, but it's called selling short. Basically, the alderman would borrow shares of George's company from a lender who does this kind of thing. And then they would sell those shares immediately and have a pile of cash. And then they would wait for the shares to drop in value. Which could happen if they changed their minds and decided not to allow a new station. Exactly. But now remember that they only borrowed those shares that they sold, right? So they would then have to repurchase them and give them back, purchase them with that pile of cash that they made. But now, because of the bad news about the station, those shares are actually cheaper to buy. So if everything goes according to their plan, then they will end up making a huge profit. Very risky. It is, yeah. And George even wonders if once they've made a fortune from his stock price going down, they'd be able to even buy more company stock and then pass the law for the station again, which would send the value back up and they'd make another fortune. And wait, are they actually trying to 
buy his company or take over his company? Well, yeah, that's actually what he says in today's show. So when he realizes what the aldermen are up to here, he decides then to secretly buy up as many shares of his company as possible, which will increase the demand for the stock and actually send the stock price up. And he also gambles all of his money, which Bertha is fine with. She says, you made it once, you can make it again. <laughs> exactly. And he does. He gambles everything. And in doing so, he manages to increase his company's stock price, which shocks everybody. Yeah, especially the older men. I mean, Patrick Morrison, Charles Fain don't know what they're going to do. Right, because they bet everything they had on the share price falling. And instead, mm -hmm. it's going up. And remember that they're going to have to buy back those shares that they borrowed and already sold. I bet all I have. So I won't just lose the money, I'll lose everything I own. Without the law, the company is ludicrously overpriced. Delaying the fall will consume his fortune. <sighs> oh, to God, you're right. Whew. And that brings us back to Mrs. Morris's visit to Bertha and her pleading for mercy and Bertha's mic drop. I mean, mm -hmm. why would she help her, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, I love that George tells the alderman when they're in his office that he's doing this not only because they double-crossed him, but because they, quote, snubbed his wife. Yes, I mean, we saw him take revenge on behalf of his wife last week at that charity bazaar. Uh, but this seems like it's on another level. Yeah. Would you say that this kind of behavior was typical for the robber barons, as they were called at the time? Well, I mean, generally speaking, robber barons were, you know, they were basically the leading capitalists of the Gilded Age. They were the heads of railroads, of industry the heads of oil companies and banking. These were men who often conducted business ruthlessly, you know, and they made huge profits. So in that respect, sure, yeah, George is definitely a robber baron. Yeah, I mean, he is definitely out to win. Remember when he wanted to set up his own railroad line in the Midwest just to drive his competitor out of business. Exactly, yeah. And Commodore Vanderbilt, Cornelius Vanderbilt, pulled the exact same kind of ruthless moves with his railroads. But the, the stock thing that we've just seen here is a bit different. That's stock manipulation. And it was quite common among financiers at the time, people like Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. These men made millions of dollars manipulating the stock market and also by bribing politicians. And were they also involved with these railroads? Absolutely. Yeah. Gould and Fisk and another character, Daniel Drew, manipulated railroad stock, especially the Erie railroads for years, making fortunes. Sometimes they were even betting against their own company's stock. Oh, that sounds shady. But how about Vanderbilt? When did he get into the railroads? Well, by the 1860s, he had made millions in steamboats. And so he started investing in and then running the New York and Harlem Railroad. And Alicia, get this. In 1863, New York City aldermen attempted to short his railroad stock oh. by repealing some legislation that had originally made his stock rise. Okay? Yeah. Once he figured out what was going on, he bought up all of the outstanding shares himself, cornering the market, which sent his stock price soaring, and it caused the alderman to come begging to him for mercy. Oh my gosh, so that, that really did happen, like the show. I'm not making it up. Yes, he taught them a lesson and they lost lots of money. Mm. And then unbelievably, the same thing would happen the next year in 1864, but this time with state legislators who were attempting to short his stock while blocking a merger. But the same thing, they they lost their fortunes. And that time he showed a little less mercy because I, I think he was getting a little grumpy. <laughs> so clearly there is, there's a lot of Vanderbilt in George Russell. Clearly, yes. <laughs> and so in the late 1860s then, he took over and merged various railroad lines to form the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. And in 1871, then, he opened a new station for that railroad in New York, Grand Central Depot on 42nd Street. That Grand Central Station? Well, actually, the station, this station, the, the depot, came first. It would be then renovated into Grand Central Station about 30 years later. 
and then eventually replaced by today's Grand Central Terminal in 1913. Gotcha. And I imagine that whoever controls those railroads also controls how people arrive in the city. Yes, his railroad, the New York Central, had a monopoly on direct passenger train service to the city. Other passenger trains coming to New York had to stop outside the city's borders. And those coming on trains from the West, which was most of the trains coming to New York, they had to stop on the other side of the Hudson River in New Jersey and then float passengers over to Manhattan on a ferry. Oh, and that's what we saw in the first episode with Marion and Peggy. You know, they come from right. Doylestown on the train to New Jersey, that side mm-hmm. of the Hudson, and then they had to catch a ferry across to New York. Exactly, yeah. And that that situation wouldn't change for decades, really, until the Pennsylvania Railroad dug tunnels under the Hudson River and opened up Pennsylvania Station in 1910. And all of that Alderman business leads to quite a few heartbreaking moments in this episode, particularly with Mr. Patrick Morris. I mean, at one point he gets down on his knees and begs Mr. Russell to stop sending the stock price up. And that was just so hard to watch. Oh, yeah. I was wincing when he got down and begged. Yeah. He had put everything he had on the line. And spoiler alert, if you haven't yet finished the episode, do so before you listen to this, but in the final scene of the episode, we see that Patrick dies by suicide. Ugh, yeah, that was so awful. And it means that Mrs. Morris is now left without a husband, without any money, and also having to deal with this damaged reputation. Yeah. I mean, that would have been shameful. And it really does make you wonder what's to become of Mrs. Morris. Yeah, if he did lose their beautiful home, I mean, what could she do at this time? I mean, sell the house, marry off the children to wealthy families, I guess. I mean, if they're not yet married, possibly get bailed out by relatives. Her options were limited. It would it would be a fall from grace. Uh, We also hear about the planned new opera house, because at this time, the Academy of Music was the only opera house in town that the society types frequented, and its private boxes were already taken by these old money families, and there was a long waiting list. It was an impossible waiting list, in fact, yeah. (laughs) The Academy, which was located down on East 14th Street, presented operas and symphony concerts, including the New York Philharmonic. It had 4,000 seats, but only 18 private boxes. And those were all held by old New York City families, and they were handed down from one generation to the next. Okay, so it would be very hard for the Russells to get one of these boxes. It would be pretty much impossible, right. (laughs) But they'd be in good company because in real life, uh, other families like the Vanderbilts and J.P. Morgan, the Goulds, and many others, they were in the same situation. They were also boxless, and they were fuming about it. And they were, in fact, preparing to take action by building their own opera house, an opera house that had many more boxes. Have you heard about this opera business? What's that? A group of the new people mean to challenge the Academy of Music and create another opera house. They can't. They think they can. They met at Delmonico's last week and decided that since they weren't allowed boxes at the Academy, they were going to build their own house. Do we know of whom this group of malcontents consists? The usual. J.P. Morgan, of course, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, every opportunist in New York. My lips are sealed. No wonder they couldn't get a box at the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> That is quite a list of malcontents. Uh huh. But this really did happen. You know, a meeting for the formation of a new opera house did take place, in fact, at Delmonico's, although it was on April 28th, 1880. So it wasn't exactly last week, but it was close enough. And did members of those families that Mrs. Morris mentioned actually go to that meeting? Some of them did, yeah. I found an article published in the next day's New York Times under the headline, The New Opera House. And it does list the attendees who were there forming this new opera house. There were families like the Vanderbilts that were relatively new, but there were also older New York families listed like the Roosevelts and the Rhinelanders. Mm -hmm. And Morgan would in fact help lead the effort 
but I didn't see his name on the list of people who are Delmonico's that day. Well, it's a very touchy subject. <laughs> so let's go through <laughs> some of the names that Anne Morris mentioned. You've got J.P. Morgan, who, of course, was involved in banking. Yep, in finance. He had made a great career in attracting British investment in American companies during the Gilded Age, when the economy was just booming. And he was also very involved in merging and restructuring companies, especially railroads. And then the Rockefellers, another very famous and rich family. John D. Rockefeller was the head of Standard Oil, just dominated the oil industry in the U.S. He had co-founded the company in Cleveland, Ohio, but then he would move it to New York City and also move his family here in 1884. So a couple years after our story. And then the Vanderbilts we just spoke about with their New York Central Railroad. Yes, I mentioned the patriarch was Cornelius, or the Commodore, as he was called because of his shipping concerns. <laughs> but Cornelius had died in 1877. So by the 1880s, we're into the third generation now of Vanderbilts, which were really led by Cornelius's grandson, William Kissam Vanderbilt, who ran the family business, the railroads, and also who had married very well. He had married Miss Alva Smith. Oh, she became the famous Alva Vanderbilt. Right. I think we spoke about her in our first episode, didn't we? Because she had just built a new lavish mansion. Yes, the couple had hired Richard Morris Hunt, who we also hear about on the show, to design a gorgeous French chateau-style mansion, uh, which was at 52nd and 5th Avenue, and that was finished in 1882. Meanwhile, up at the other new mansion on 65th Street, uh, Mrs. <laughs> Russell is keeping Gladys under lock and key. Gladys is not officially out yet, mainly because, as Aunt Agnes says, Bertha isn't sure yet if she can fill a ballroom. And, Tom, when we talk about coming out in terms of the context of this show, it refers to the social custom of being a debutante introduced to society. Yes, exactly. Young women would be presented to adult society at the proper age and usually at a ball around which there were all kinds of rules. By coming out, you were also signaling the end of childhood, right, and the beginning of womanhood and also eligibility for marriage. But George Russell thinks that Gladys should be out already and says that girls her age are getting married. So what age did girls generally get married during the Gilded Age? And is Gladys late to this debutante party? Generally, they came out at 16. I mean, there were exceptions, but generally, yes, 16. Mm. So really, everybody here seems to be ready for Gladys to come out, including Gladys, yeah. you know, everybody except for her mother. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so that's the Russells, but now let's talk about Peggy. She is really getting somewhere with her writing. She receives a letter from the publisher of The Christian Advocate who wants to print some of her stories, though when she visits the office and they see she is black, they suddenly have several stipulations they want her to agree with, or I should say, adjustments. You said adjustments. What other changes must I make to be published? Your name is fine. It does not suggest anything about your background, so we can keep it. But your race would have to remain concealed. How would that work? We'd have you sign a document that you accept our policy, which would prevent you divulging publicly that you are the writer of any stories we might publish. My own stories? Once we buy them, they would be ours. So, you understand what I'm saying? I think so. Good. The Christian advocate is asking me to lie. Yep, that is exactly what they're asking her to do. But luckily, Peggy would have had some other options because the newspaper industry was huge in New York. Here's a little fact that I found. In the mid-1800s, there were 373 newspapers published in America and 54 of those originated in New York. And that included a lot of these specialty newspapers. Like the Christian Advocate, which was a widely read weekly newspaper that was published by the Methodist Episcopal Church, um, read throughout the country. It, um, it actually had been started in the 1820s. So being published here would have been a big deal for Peggy. Yeah, and as the editor points out, 
there were two white guys in a bar around the corner who would have killed to be in her position. But as she points out, they would never be in her position. So true. And you also get a sense here of how New York was the capital of American journalism, right? I mean, still is. But at the time of our story, there was just a huge variety of newspapers published in New York. There were papers that came out in the morning. We see Bertha reading the paper with breakfast in bed, sometimes before hurling the breakfast. <laughs> we see afternoon and evening papers sometimes coming in with bad news. Of course, there were also large daily papers like the Times and the Herald and the Tribune. There were Brooklyn papers like the Daily Eagle and Brooklyn Daily News. Weekly papers, there were tons of different types of newspapers. Yeah, there are also the trade and industry newspapers. And financial papers, like the Wall Street Journal, which would start up in 1889. Plus the foreign language papers in many different languages. Right, which would be incredibly important for people who were moving to New York from all over the world. But I want to turn us for a second back into the Van Ryan house, down into the kitchen so that we can talk for a moment about Jack and Bridget, the youngest members of the staff at the Van Ryan House, who are heading off to a Magic Lantern show. Now, Alicia, you're the film historian here. What was this all about? What happened during a Magic Lantern show? Oh, yes, I am uh, rolling up my sleeves. People can't see this, but I'm excited because this is a subject I actually know about. So basically, <laughs> the idea of cinema as we know it started later in the 1890s with inventions by Thomas Edison and the Lumiere brothers. But before that, there were these magic lantern shows. And, and were these like slideshows? Well, the magic lantern was essentially an early slide projector. And usually these images were accompanied by live music, which is what we see in the show. And there was lectures a lot on art and science, but there were some that were just for entertainment. And Tony Pastor, who was a performer who owned the theatre on 14th Street, which we see Jack and Bridget go to, he would actually stage these sing-along Magic Lantern shows where he projected the lyrics of a song for the audience to sing along to. It's like Gilded Age karaoke. <laughs> yeah, early karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, in this episode, then, we see the audience not singing along, but actually getting very frightened when they see images of a train coming towards them. Yeah. Did that kind of experience really happen at one of these shows? I don't think that would have happened at the Magic Lantern shows, but that seems to me to be a nod to one of the earliest motion pictures that were, was projected to an audience in 1896. It was a short film by the Lumiere brothers, just some footage of a train arriving at a station, but the audience saw a train coming directly to them and and as the urban legend goes, they thought it was real and they got freaked out. Not sure how true that is or not, but it makes for a fun story. But of course, Tom, at this time, the Magic Lantern shows weren't the only sources of fun in the entertainment industry. There was also live theatre. Oh, yeah. A lot of it, actually, in New York City. There's always been live theatre. By the 1880s, the theater scene would have been centered around Madison Square, 23rd Street, and up to Herald Square at 34th Street. The Broadway theater scene wouldn't really jump up to today's theater district for another 20 or 25 years. Okay, well, the other big event in this episode that we have to talk about is the return of Mr. Tom Rakes. So mm -hmm. he has his job in New York. He comes to live in the city, but Aunt Agnes remains unimpressed. She says he's an adventurer and is not suitable for Marion. But later, Marion and Peggy meet Tom Rakes at the hand of the Statue of Liberty, where Rakes asks for Marion's hand in marriage. <laughs> How did I not make that connection before? Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy that they actually included this particular really unusual moment in uh, Lady Liberty's journey to America when her hand and her torch were exhibited in Madison Square Park on 23rd Street. So you could really go and visit her hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was on display because they were raising money to pay for her pedestal. You'll remember that France was giving the U.S. the statue, but we had to provide the pedestal in New York Harbor, and the government was actually being very stingy and wouldn't pay. 
So then you would pay money to to what go inside the arm? Yes, you could pay 50 cents to climb a ladder inside her arm to go up to the torch and to the balcony cool. up there. And the arm would sit in Madison Square Park for six years until 1882, the year of our show. And then obviously they eventually raised the funds to build that pedestal. Yes, the fundraising picked up and the statue would be dedicated in 1886 with a pedestal designed, Alicia, by Richard Morris Hunt. No, he did everything. But wait, Tom, I do have a very important question for you. Are you on Team Tom Rakes? Am I on his team? Like, do I trust him? Do I think he's an adventurer? Yeah. (laughs) I, you know, I'm not sure yet. I mean, I would definitely be more on Team Tom Rakes if he had actually forked over a dollar for both of them to climb up her arm. Yes. Um, I mean, he could have popped the question to her up there on the balcony. That would have been perfect. I don't know about Tom Rakes just yet, but I have to say I am on Team Ada. Yes. (laughs) She is my favourite character in the show. And Cynthia Nixon, who plays Aunt Ada, will be joining us next alongside director Sally Richardson-Whitfield. This is the official Gilded Age podcast. Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back. My dear Miss Ada, I'm afraid I've only just noticed the time. I'm already late for an appointment. But you've come all the way from 4th Street. And now he has to get back. But surely you can stay for a few minutes. Nothing would give me more pleasure. Sadly, it's just not possible. I am sorry. Bannister, will you see Mr. Eckhart out? We can manage here. Yes, ma'am. Ladies. Right this way, Mr. Eckhart. What a very strange thing. I don't remember him as rude. Oh, I think he's just a very busy man. Never mind. I want your help with the menus tomorrow. And uh, please, choose something that you really like. I want to spoil you for once. I can't think why. I can. I think Ada always deserves to be spoiled. Hello there, and (laughs) welcome back to the official Gilded Age podcast. I'm Tom Myers, joined by my co-host, Alicia Malone, to talk about episode three of the Gilded Age titled Face the Music. And now we are honored to be joined by two very special guests, Cynthia Nixon, who plays Aunt Ada in the show, and director Sally Richardson-Whitfield. Hello to you both. Hello, thank you for having us. Hello, hello, happy to be here. We're so happy to talk to you both. And, you know, Cynthia, of course, we all know you from Sex and the City and and just like that. You also grew up in New York City. You've been very actively involved with the city as well. So I'm curious to know whether the fact that the Gilded Age is based on the history of New York was an extra draw card for you, as well as being involved with Julian Fellows and this great cast. I mean, yes, certainly for me, I'm endlessly fascinated by New York and it is also my home. So it's always a pleasure and a treat getting to shoot where you live. But yes, obviously getting to work with Julian, you know, I was a huge Downton Abbey fan. And I just think it's a really fascinating period of time in New York and in America and a time that is strangely resonant with the current period, actually. Absolutely. And Cynthia, what about the character of Aunt Ada? What excited you about playing her? And what did you find challenging about that character? I love Ada. I'm so fond of her. I feel like she's a character that I don't get to play that often. I often play very brainy, confrontational people, very self-assured and very opinionated. And Ada is really kind of the opposite of that. If Christine Baranski's character, Agnes, is like the, I don't know, the mountain, Ada is the water that runs around her and is constantly shifting and adjusting, but actually, as we know about mountains and water, has its impact over time. 
Yeah, I think Ada is definitely my favourite in the show. I just kind of want to give her a big <laughs> hug. <laughs> and, and Sally, you know, you've been in the industry as well for a long time, both as a director and as an actor, and you've directed so many different genres from, you know, comic book superheroes to some period dramas. So for you, what was it about this show that got you excited? Well, I was definitely a Julian Fellows fan. And for me, it's it's really a challenge. It's like a new period, a new time, something that I had to research and all of us had to research etiquette. It really becomes a big part of it, different human behavior. So it really became about working with Julian, working with these wonderful actors and just a new journey into a new time for me. Sally, actually, in this episode, there's a scene where Peggy Scott is speaking with her father, Arthur, across from the Van Ryan house next to Central Park. And he is trying to convince her to come home to Brooklyn, to move back where she can, I think he says, enter through the front door and not sneak in through the basement. And so I, I wonder if you could kind of take us into that scene a little bit. And also as a woman of color directing a period piece about the Gilded Age, what insights then were you bringing here that might often get overlooked in depictions of the Gilded Age? Well, I think that for all of us, it was important to show that there were not only people of color during this time, but that there were people of color who had had wealth mm -hmm. and lived in a different way. And, and how do we show that authentically and with dignity? which was really the balance that we had to find. How do we get Peggy in this home that she might not necessarily ever be in and have it make sense, but still keep the dignity of this character? So um, I think that became our whole balance. And we were very lucky to have such wonderful actors who can find that, find the balance of when there's white people walking by, mm -hmm. you may not be able to necessarily look them in the eye I because something dangerous could happen to you. Mm -hmm. But how do we do that and still respect this character? So I think our actors did a great job. That particular scene you're talking about really confronts that head on because yes, you're in this kind of high society area, but if you were at home where we have our wealth, you would be able to hold your head up high there. Why would you want to put yourself in this situation? Yeah. And while they're having that conversation, they actually have to step back. Exactly. To let a white couple go through. And that is a really intense moment. Yeah. And I think that you can see with her father, it's a wound when things like that happen. But you have to do that because you, I mean, at this time, they could just take you off to jail if they decided that you offended them. So it's a delicate scene within this beautiful scene between father and daughter. I think that that's the one thing the show has been doing really well at is entertaining, educating without you really knowing you're being educated. And <laughs> we don't want to be educated when we're watching a show, but you find a way to learn something. Yes. And I imagine, Cynthia, for you and the rest of the actors, it must be so helpful to have Sally as your director, someone who has been an actor herself and can speak that language. Yes. I mean, I have to say I directed my first episode of television just this past year. And so many of the actors said to me, oh, it's so great. You, you know how to talk to us. And I think that that is, was so abundantly clear of Sally, not even when she started directing, but even like from her first moments on the set, when she they were meeting us for the first time and wanting to, I remember she and I, it was COVID, right? I mean, it's still COVID, but it was intense COVID at that moment. Mm -hmm. We were one of the first shows to go back. And um we snatched a moment with our masks on, you know, kind of in the shadows of the set and talked about Ada and talked about Ada and Agnes's relationship. And I think we talked about so many of the issues, not only for the characters, but Cynthia talked about them from her point of view and Sally talked about them from her point of view. And I feel like that is the mark of, of an actor turned director, that they go right to the heart of the interior life of the character. Mm. And speaking of that interior life, um, in the clip that we just heard uh, in this episode, Ada reconnects with the childhood friend, Cornelius Eckerd III. And, you know, I feel like the audience really wanted that to work out. And it's it seems <laughs> like it seems like Ada was really excited about it. Right. Do you think that Ada 
understands what has happened or is she just kind of in the dark about this sort of thing? I think she doesn't understand. I think she's very confused. I think she's very confused, not just by that scene in which he runs away quickly, but I think she's confused by her entire interaction with him. You know, Mary and her niece, who is excited about it and maybe sees what it is, and maybe there's a possibility of a romance or even a marriage there. And so Marion is the person who's really pushing that. But Ada is just sort of startled to see him and sort of pleased. But I think the idea that he might be a suitor is so beyond the pale for her, so unimaginable that she doesn't even really let herself think about it. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe it's buried in her unconscious and maybe sometime weeks from now or months from now, she'll reflect back on it. And Marion is trying to push her into a romance and Agnes is trying to pull her out of danger. But Ada is largely confused about what the stakes might be. Yeah, one moment I love during that scene is where we see Agnes and Ada both picking up the teacups at the same time and drinking from them in exactly the same way. It kind of shows that despite their differences, they have so many similarities. So Sally, for you as a director, how much fun is it to get to create those moments where you can say so much with an image and not just dialogue? Well, I have to tell you that particular moment is one of my favorites and one of those sort of happy accidents that happened. Like we got it from one side and the two of them brought it up so perfectly. And I'm like, oh, we have to do it from the other side because all of a sudden you get it. You get who these two women are just from that beautiful moment. And I can't tell you how many, when you're doing a show, there's people who like to cut out the pretty and cut out those moments. And it really is one of those moments where I'm like, no, we're staying in this two shot and we're staying in it until they sip on that cup of tea together because it was important to me. And that's what I do love about a show like this. You can take the time to have those beautiful moments that speak volumes without you even having to talk. That's one of my favorite, favorite moments. Mine too. And I think it's a little bit funny. It's slightly comedic. But I think the reason that it happens is both women kind of don't know what to say. And they're thinking in very different ways, but they're thinking hard about what just happened. And so taking a sip of tea is just sort of a way of biding yourself time because you're not ready to speak. You're not ready to move on. And so in some ways, they are on the same page in terms of needing to take a moment and needing to recover a little bit. Yeah, it says something about your relationship with your sister there, right? It's a tenderness. You know, in the first episode of the podcast, we spoke to Christine and she mentioned, Cynthia, that you and she go way back working together as actresses. I wonder if you could tell us what it was like for you to create in this show, the sisterly dynamic between the two of you. Yes. So we worked together in 1983 and 1984, which I guess that's almost 40 years ago. I guess it is. 39 years ago. I was 17 and Christine was playing my mother. She was too young to be my mother, but never occurred to me at the time. But I worshipped her then as I worship her now. She was always incredibly tender with me. And you know, when you're a child actor, not everybody is. Some people you're kind of less than a person, I would say, and kind of a little bit of a nuisance. But Christine was so warm to me and so kind and so doting. And I loved her and I admired her so much. And I, I've always just been a fan, certainly of her performances, which I always run out and see and devour. Not only her talent, but her meticulousness, the way she builds a character, the way she builds a performance is stunning. As a child actor, I was always particularly looking to actresses who were older than I was, who I admired, not just for their careers, but for the way that they had it all is the way we put it, you know, had these wonderfully exciting careers, but had these marriages, love relationships, children, and that there was really a great balance of the personal and professional. I feel like there is no better example in the world than Christine Baranski of, of being masterful at that. <laughs> Well, you work so well together and, you know, you both have theatre backgrounds. And Sally, when you look at this cast, I mean, it is 
stacked, <laughs> full of incredible actors, many of which came from the theater. So what was it like for you to get to work with this level of cast? It was an honor. It makes it a little easier in the day. I mean, really, you get with these people and you have to give a small adjustment. These are complete professionals. They know what they're doing. It makes my life easier. But, you know, what's wonderful for me is to know that even no matter how long these people have had a career, there is something I can contribute. We all need that third eye. And you need that person to come in and go, Listen, Cynthia, hey, can you tighten up this little bit? Can you give me a little more emotion just on this one thing? It makes everything so easy. But there would be times we'd have these dinner parties. You know, this is probably every Broadway star in New York is, is around a table. They all know each other. People start singing. They start quoting from different plays that they've been in together. So, I mean, it was just, it was fun and easy. All I had to really worry about was the picture and maybe some of the younger actors. <laughs> but I wanted to say something about Miss Cynthia because I do love Ada too. And it feels so different than who she is, which is obviously what you want. And Ada is so sweet and innocent, yet a little more clever than you think she is. And it wasn't until I really started cutting some of these episodes together for a lot of the people, but where you really see the nuance of what they're doing and the work that they've put behind it. And it just falls in so beautifully. And I just wanted to say that because I just, sometimes you can't completely see it when you're shooting it. And then it just all falls in so perfectly. And Ada is so different and so perfect. Well, thank you, Sally. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I remember very well that first conversation we had, Sally, where we talked about the idea of, of Ada and Agnes being sisters, you know, who lived together for a long time and almost being like a married couple. And that Agnes is really the power. She's the older sister. She's the bossy one. She's the quote unquote smart one. And not insignificant, she controls the purse strings. It's her money. And so I think what we see about Ada is just a sweet person at heart, but she also, when you're living on other people's charity, it behooves you to be sweet, right? To stay in their good graces and to be a welcome presence, not an annoyance. But I think that, you know, there are so many different ways of people who are not in the power seat in our show that find ways to get around it and find ways to press their advantage and seize the opportunity. And it's a harder position to be in because yeah. you have to navigate in a different way. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And so I think that that Ada is sort of like the traditional wife of the couple. You know, she's she's trying to tend to Agnes's emotional life. She's trying to smooth yeah. things out. Really, you know, Agnes is the person who barks <laughs> and Ada is the person who stays after and tries to, tries to smooth <laughs> it. But, but as we know, sometimes the people who are not the power force but actually have their ear to the ground actually have a lot more influence and know a lot more about what's happening than the person at the top. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting to look at the role of women during this time because they didn't necessarily have power in society, but they had power in their own society. And uh, for you, Cynthia, did you do a lot of research into the role of women? Because Ada also understands Agnes a bit more than Marion does. She understands the kind of sacrifices that Agnes has had to make as a woman just to survive. Yes, we were given lists and lists of both fiction and, and nonfiction books. And it was very interesting to read about the social mores and the customs. And it seems so complicated and almost like what I think about is like Japanese society from 200 years ago. The leaving of one social card and all the customs around that are endlessly complicated, flower arranging kind of a thing. I, I read a number of books about the actual noteworthy people of the time and events that happened. I also read and reread a number of works by Edith Wharton and Henry James, which were also very valuable. I would have thought initially that reading facts would have been the most important, but reading these great novels with a lot of the interior life of the characters was every bit as valuable. 
And it's so cool how you mentioned Edith Wharton, how Age of Innocence takes you into the opera battles. I mean, many of the, right. the opera has, you see these scenes come to life, which as somebody who just loves New York City history, I just can't get enough of that. I'm so glad that so much time was spent portraying that accurately on the screen. I also love the fact that Ada goes into detail explaining to Agnes in an opening scene how Marion is going to arrive by transportation. You know, she's going to take this train and then the ferry and then the elevated and the whole thing. <laughs> yes. It's amazing that level of detail was spelled out. But it does seem also like Ada is excited, is she not, Cynthia, to have her niece coming to live with them? Yes. I mean, I think Ada and Agnes's lives, while they're comfortable and pleasant, they are extremely uneventful and extremely controlled. I mean, it's a very controlled period in general, but I think Ada has so many desires for Marion to come and live with them. I think first and foremost, it's the desire to do the right thing, to come to their brother's daughter's aid at this time of great crisis, to protect her, to help her, to lift her up. But I think for Ada, who has never married and has no children of her own, and has a slightly prickly relationship with her nephew, it's not an incredibly warm relationship. I think that both she sees the chance for a kind of a surrogate daughter, and I think she sees the chance to perhaps intervene and protect at this young woman who at this very fragile moment when she could go up or she could go down. And I think that Ada feels with some justification, although she wouldn't complain about it necessarily, that Ada's happiness and the course that her life took, no one was really there looking out for it. Agnes was there making sure there was money and they didn't starve, but nobody was really there looking toward Ada's emotional happiness, trying to find a match for her, trying to find a profession for her, trying to find something that would give her life meaning. And so I think this is one of Ada's many ulterior motives with Marion is to make sure that at this crucial time in a woman's life, that there is someone there masterminding and, and advising and prodding and directing. When you were just talking about the scene where Cynthia talks about the travel of Marion, that is a true testament of a great actor, because that could sound like a list all day. And on paper, it is. And she found that meaning in it. Yeah. And Sally, when it comes to a period drama, you know, as Cynthia mentioned, it's very controlled, but this also feels so fast paced. You know, there's so much happening and so much information coming our way. What is the balance for you as a director of keeping up the pace, but also making sure the audience can, can catch on to everything that's happening? You just find that moment to open up the world. And that is what keeps it pretty, mm -hmm. but then you get back to the comedy of Julian's writing. You may not see it, but he always casts the right people who just kind of fill in these spaces with this great humor. Yeah. But at the end of the day is how do we get this nice witty dialogue and then we open it up to this huge, massive, beautiful shot of Newport. And that is what keeps this beautiful marriage of beauty and pace. And there's a lot of beauty as well in the kitchen. I have to say, already by this episode, we've seen some beautiful food. Yeah. And we've seen wonderful, wonderful dinners and wonderful lunches. In this episode, Ada gets to eat out with Eckert and Marion and Mrs. Astor. Sally, I have heard that you love to cook. Oh, so you, I do. <laughs> I've heard you talk about that in other interviews. So I'm curious, like, you must be having a blast with all of the food scenes. I have to tell you, we have the chef that is on our set who's making this food is unbelievable. And most of that mm. food is, that you're seeing, or not most of it, it's real and it's good. And you're walking around picking on it. Carrie, she ate so much cheese one day at this <laughs> dinner party. I thought she was going to explode from dairy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah the, the food... He would bring in these massive loaves of olive bread. And I, when I say massive, like I could hold it in the width of my arms. And I'd have to say, even in the age of COVID, I would walk by and grab a slice of bread when no one was. No, I was like, I'm the director. I can eat any of this food I want to. 
Uh, but, you know, this was a big part of their world. That's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have a lot to do. If you're changing your outfit for every meal, you need to fill time. So every meal was an event and it was hours and hours. You have course after course after course. You don't eat that whole course or you never get through it. So it really is all about their meals there half of the time. So we had to get that right. I think, Cynthia, I don't know. You were there at the dinner. When we talk about shooting and <laughs> etiquette, I think we shot this one dinner scene over and over and over just because people would pick up their glass the wrong way. And if you pick up, oh my God, it would be like, it's perfect, nope. <laughs> So-and-so picked up their glass by the top. You got to pick it up by the stem and you'd have to redo the whole thing. It becomes a big headache if everyone isn't, hasn't done their research and isn't paying attention. <laughs> yes. And I was, a, I was a major culprit. So hard to pick up my wine, my, my wine glass by the stem. And you not can't the, do this. I know. But, you know, it's interesting just to return for a minute to the question of pace and a, and a director. I mean, it's really certainly events take a lot longer. Meals take a lot longer. Dressing takes a lot longer. And they speak in a different way. They speak in a more ornamental way than we do today. But they still think as quickly as we do. And they still react emotionally as quickly as we do today. Absolutely. And, you know, I've been reading all these books and they talk about all the changes of dress, as we were saying, the morning dress and the day dress and the evening dress. And so for you, Cynthia, what is it like wearing these costumes? You know, what are the pleasures and the challenges of it? You know, the pleasures of it are how beautiful they are and how beautifully designed and how beautifully built and the fabrics are amazing and the buttons and every last, the trimming, every last detail. Um, and they're all individually made, of course, for each performer. So they fit like a glove. And, you know, I remember because COVID, we were like five days away from shooting back in March of 2020. And then we, we shut down until September. I remember Michael Engler had, we'd all gone away from the project. And I remember he was talking about one time when we were getting ready to start up, he walked through the wardrobe department where all these racks and racks of clothes were waiting. And he said, you just look at a rack of clothing and you know immediately which character that is because they're so distinct. They were so, Kasha, who did our clothes, they're so distinctly designed with the character in mind. And so the pleasures of wearing them, you do feel so much like your character because she's paid such attention to who the characters are. I mean, the unfun part of wearing them I, <laughs> is wearing a corset and wearing a corset for many, many hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you would think that a corset would actually give you better posture, but it does the opposite, right? It's so strange. I mean, it, it does make you stand up while you're in it but it works against your muscles because you don't have to use your back muscles to hold yourself up. You just kind of, you know, relax and let the corset hold you up. And, you know, they say that women in that period who, who wore these all the time, all day, every day, kind of couldn't really relax without them because they actually didn't have the strength to hold them themselves up their their muscles had atrophy wow, but wow. I have to say I just thought we would have these corsets on all day and never take them off until the end of the day but they were very wonderful about certainly we took them off at lunch and then every time we did have a costume change we would get a little time with them off and sometimes they would you know loosen our laces for things when we were not directly on camera so there were a lot of breaks but definitely the corsets were the challenge. Well, Cynthia Nixon and Sally Richardson Whitfield, thank you both so much. This has really been wonderful. Thank you. It's been great talking to you all. Thank you, guys. Well, Tom, how much fun was that? I loved when they were talking about all the Broadway actors being around the same table. Can you imagine just being a fly oh. on the wall and hearing them all sing? That would have been amazing, and I have to wonder, when they were all sitting around the table, how were they picking up their wine glasses? Alicia, by the stem? <laughs> by the stem. <laughs> by the stem. I mean, that must have been tricky because it was <laughs> not only did you have to worry about continuity, but you also had to worry about etiquette on top of that. Crazy. Uh, 
Wow, amazing. Please join us again for another episode of the official Gilded Age podcast. Next week, we have more interviews with the cast and crew. And we'll be visiting Brooklyn to talk about the history of Brooklyn and the Black Elite. So don't forget to watch new episodes of The Gilded Age Mondays on HBO and HBO Max before tuning in to the next podcast. And we'll speak to you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.